Hey guys, welcome to Ruth Got Truth. That's right, this four chapter little story is rich. And I mean like chocolate cake rich. I think you guys are gonna get a lot out of this. And we're gonna bear witness to God working in the everyday lives of his people. Are you ready? Oh Shenandoah, I long to see you. Let's go ahead and read chapter one together. Here we go. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Milan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Melon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with your people. But Naomi replied, Why should you go on with me? Can I give birth to other sons who would grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. I know it seems like a short thing to note that it happened during the time the judges ruled, but guys, this was supposed to bring up to the people listening to this story the level of turmoil within Israel at this time. It was some dark times. You know, if if you mention 2020 to people, people don't have a positive association with that year, generally speaking, right? You're like, well, the year was 2020. Can you imagine telling your grandkids about all the things that you've been through this year? It would be like that if you mentioned, well, I was alive during the period of the judges. So what was so dark about this time? Let's dive into it. Even if you haven't read the book of Judges as a whole, I bet you can remember some of the key characters, some of the heroes. They're not much of heroes at all. They're almost anti-heroes. Yeah, think of Samson, right? What a honey badger of a person, right? God gives him the strength and he just uses it for whatever he wants to do, tying foxes uh, together and setting their tails on fire to kind of pillage the Philistines like what is going on here there's Gideon right 
and there's Jepta, this guy who makes this really rash vow and ends up sacrificing his own daughter. Yes, the stories in the book of Judges are dark. It was a dark time for a long time. And that's where our story takes place. There's this pattern in the book of Judges where God's people fall into sin, either through idolatry or ignoring God's covenant with them. And then God sends judgment in the form of military defeat, usually, the Philistines. After they, they ask God to help, it, it, it humbles them, right? We've talked about the humiliation of, of covenant defeat. They're humbled and God sends a rescuer, which leads to renewal in their faith. And then they forget God and fall into sin again. And this, this thing, it just feels like it just cycles and cycles and cycles. And things just keep getting worse. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way to 11, you kind of have this spiraling out of the consequences of sin. And then the flood and, and all of this stuff. And it just seems like things keep getting worse. It feels like that in the period of the judges where you have God's people finally in the promised land, right? With this, with this covenant. This is right after Joshua and his generation. And yet they just don't obey, love, and honor God and each other in the way that God invited them into with the covenant. Where is covenant obedience in the generation of the judges? Where is this group of people that's supposed to represent God's kingdom to the world? Remember in Exodus chapter 19, God invited his people into this representative covenant, which really calls all the way back to Genesis 12, what Abraham's descendants were supposed to do to bless the world through their relationship with God, which really harkens all the way back to Adam and to Eve and all of humanity invited into representing God. And they suck at it, royally suck. Like just, just on a cata cataclysmic scale, they suck in the period of Judges. And the book closes with this weird civil war and like a chopped up body of a girl that got abused. It is really dark, really dark times. And that's the context of this story in which we find God moving in the margins and in hope. So back to the book of Ruth. It opens with this scene of uh, ecological refugees traveling from a place where there is famine to the plains of Moab where there is grain and food for them to settle and make their livelihood. Now, why would Israel, and, and particularly Bethlehem, why would that place not have food? Wasn't that part of God's covenant plan, this this way of, of showing Israel that he's with them? You remember the covenant? Well, if you look at Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll see that indeed, what this is, it's taking a spiritual temperature on the place these refugees are fleeing. And in fact, as we know with the period of judges, they are, they've breached the covenant. They are not in covenant love with God, and God is trying to get their attention through this ecological disaster. But how does that play out in the lives of individuals? Even if it's on a corporate level, on a national scale, maybe we can get the picture that Israel is in need of national repentance. But what about these poor folks that have to travel? Well, is God with them? Is God still faithful to the individuals that carry out his covenant? So keep this in mind. We have people traveling from another place, sojourners, you know, ecological refugees, and they're gonna come to Bethlehem. So keep an eye out for that. What's gonna happen when they get there? Are there certain ways that God envisioned his people welcoming these kind of people in need. Is God going to be working somehow with whatever he set up for Israel long ago? Keep your eyes out for that as we read this text over the next few weeks. There's another complication to this story that you may have already noticed. These are two women traveling alone in 
this really challenging time. You remember what happened uh, in the period of Judges, if, if you're uh, part of this original audience, that that was a time that not only was, was abnormally violent for everybody, it was particularly violent for women at this time. And that's not how God drew this up. Yes, ancient Israel largely was a patriarchal society, and the covenant context is given within that cultural normativity. But there were protections. There were protections for women, and particularly vulnerable women like these widows. And is that making you a little nervous about this story? Like, what's going to happen? Are people going to treat them right? How is their road there? Did anybody feel a little tense about this? Like, ooh, I, I hope they make it out, out all right because this is this is a challenging time to be a widow, a single woman in a rough dog eat dog world. I took a class on Hebrew narrative with a fantastic professor named Christine Palmer, and Dr. Palmer took us through some of the nuances of the original culture, and she mentioned that. In this time, in, in, in this kind of world, the ancient Near East, widows often had two options if they weren't able to find another husband. And Naomi being as old as she was, her two options were becoming a servant or becoming a prostitute. As Christine Palmer put it, you needed to belong to a patriarch to advocate for you. So can you see why, out of love, Naomi wanted Ruth and Orpah to go home to their parents, to to uh, kind of be folded back into their other family systems, because that was the safety net for people at this time. And to, to be remarried in, in, in their own people group, why would they stick with Naomi? There is, there's, there, they've, they've done their covenant obligation, and now the family unit has dissolved because the patriarchs were the glue so what do they do? And Ruth shows us something really, really fascinating. And we're going to spend some time thinking about that. Naomi is facing kind of a, a bit of an oblivion. Territory was passed on, um, you know, through the, the mail in, in this time uh, because her husband died and her sons died. And now she's an old widow. What is to become of her family? What is to become of her future? She has no inheritance to pass to, and she herself, how is she going to, to own any of this at this time? So, where the family no longer holds territory and cannot be passed and there's no heir, it's kind of an ancient concept of, uh, of disappearing, of, of oblivion. This is a dead family tree, and it's rapidly fading. Why? Why would Ruth cling to that? What hope does she have? And here, we see that the contours of her hope go beyond the grave. So you guys know we've been going through this discipline of lament, and Naomi is no stranger to suffering. She gives full voice to it. She wants Ruth to know, do you realize what you're getting yourself into? God and his hand is against me, is her claim. And we're going to assess that claim. We're going to see how it holds water. It's important to note here that Naomi is, is indeed suffering. She has much to complain about. We give voice to the reality of our pain. Dr. Palmer put it this way, suffering has a place in the life of God's people. We should not ignore it, acknowledge it, and be faithful. And I believe even though Naomi sounds so pessimistic, that's what she's trying to do. But she doesn't have quite the eyes to see the presence of God at the moment, because little does she know it at this time. God is working through a pagan foreigner in her life. And we're going to see how that unfolds. So in the opening scene setting of the book of Ruth, you have so much hardship, so much heartbreak working against these two individuals wrapped up at a challenging time in history, being vulnerable in so many ways and marginalized, and they're facing oblivion. And just 
take a look at this. This is tough times. You, you're in the period of judges, of Israel's utter covenant disobedience and disarray. You're uh, experiencing uh, a, a drought, and you're trying to provide for yourself, and, and, and you, you're a refugee, you, you know, and, and you're bringing a foreigner with you. And then you have uh, the fact that they're widows, and, and there's no patriarch that's, that's there for them. All of them have died. Who's going to provide? What options do they have and still remain faithful to God? And at the same time, uh, when they get back, is there any is there any land for them? How can they hold property? Their family tree is is drying up and almost gone. How on earth would God turn this around? Would He be there for them? What can we expect? Is He going to show up? Have you ever felt that way where you're like, I don't know where you are right now, God. Where? This is a lamentable scenario. Where is God when it seems like he's not there in the lives of the individuals who hope to follow him and believe in his goodness, but don't see it? And within the narrative art of this story, we find this theme. In fact, the Lord's name appears in this story a number of times. You'll hear it all across, but never does that word, Yahweh, does he actually do a verb in the storytelling? Let me rephrase. The way they tell the story, it makes you wonder, is is God actually doing anything? And so we're invited to see this almost from the kind of perspective that we ourselves have. We know that God feeds us and, and clothes us, and we know that that uh, God provides. We know that God is with us. But have we actually seen God do it? Have we seen God make food for us? You, you get what I'm getting at? In the Bible, there's often stories where God does miraculous things and the people bear witness to it. They know it's him. And here in the book of Ruth, we're asking, where is God working? Is he here? And I think you'll see quite poignantly that in fact, God is there in their everyday lives. And one of the ways that he's there for Naomi is through Ruth herself. There's this word that's thematic in this book, and it's thematic uh, for a number of reasons across uh, the Old Testament canon. It's it's in Hebrew, chesed. Go ahead and try it. It's fun. you got to get the, the phlegm, you know, kind of loosen it up. Chesed. And it's a word that appears in the covenant name of God. This is part of his character. Sometimes it's translated as loving kindness. Sometimes it's covenant love. Uh, sometimes it is steadfast love. I'm going to use the nuance covenant love. Uh, because I feel like that captures it the best. He's just kind of blessing Orpah and Ruth and, and saying that the, the Lord should treat you kindly, like, may the Lord treat you kindly. That's that word. May he show you chesed. In opposition to that, she says that the Lord has uh, dealt with her bitterly, that his hand is upon her. So kind of the opposite expectation in her life. Is God's chesed, his covenant love, his loving kindness, his steadfast presence, is it with Naomi? And Naomi is more or less contending it's not but let's take a look at what ruth says to naomi where you will go i'll go where you'll stay i'll stay this is a covenant it is it is covenant poetry the the bible elevates poetry in moments of significance at the creation of humanity right you have this little you'll see in your bibles it's kind of moved to the side as if it was a bar of poetry in the image of god he made them in the in male and female he made them in the image of god and it's a poetic verse and we see the same thing of a of a marriage covenant uh they will uh, adam and eve that the, the two will become one flesh a bone of my bone flesh of my flesh and it's it's poetic it's a covenant formula and so these significant moments here we have this pagan widowed foreigner committing to her mother-in-law beyond any cultural expectation beyond any covenant that they had she is making in poetic verse in dramatic fashion an act of covenant she is showing covenant love and perhaps there in this depth of friendship is the very presence of god in covenant love. We're bound away. Oh, Shenandoah, I love your daughter. 
And as Dr. Palmer pointed out during my class, this is a hope beyond the grave that they would be together. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if I don't stick with you even to the, to the grave. And she would argue that this is a prefigured hope in the resurrection. That whatever Ruth and Naomi are bonded to because of this covenant goes beyond death and the grave. So what is this hope? Even in the face of oblivion, in the, in the face of marginalization, and in the face of, of deep uncertainty and actual probability of their end coming soon, Ruth commits to Naomi. Where is God in Naomi's life? He's there through Ruth. So let me try to pull this a little bit into your world, into my world, into the place we occupy as we interact with scripture. We're going to be chewing on these things. We're going to be chewing on the nature and character of God. But I think this is a crucial point. When we're looking for the character of God, when we're looking for his covenant love, sometimes the way he appears in our lives is through the people around us, the people that are committed to us. I think you could look to your parents, your friends, your fellow youth, your youth mentors, your church. If you ever feel like God isn't there, God, you've dealt with me bitterly. And though I wish God to, I, I want to bless other people by asking God to deal with them with kindness, with covenant love, with chesed. I don't know that I see it in my own. And let me just say this. This kind of friendship that goes beyond the grave, this is what we're craving. This is what we're looking for. It's what you'll find within those who commit themselves to Christ. Ruth is even a new convert. She's going to follow through the, a pact of, of, of love and friendship. She's going to encounter God in remarkable ways because of her fidelity to Naomi. And so it's so surprising where we see God's love show up in this story, where we see his chesed. So don't miss it in your own life. If you feel like you're not sure where God is and you feel like maybe maybe there's some flakiness, you've got some orpas around, right? Some people that just live a normal kind of friendship. But can you see those that are there with you through thick and thin that are going to be with you and your God even beyond the grave. That's the kind of transformative friendship through covenant love that God can reveal himself through and provide for us through the, the character of others. God is around you, my brothers and sisters, and his character is present in those around you who love him too. Look for these relationships, cherish them, and as we see the story of Ruth unfold, we'll see how God can use this display, this commitment, this fidelity to one another, this covenant love to accomplish his work. If his people would love each other, don't you think God is going to show up? God is not removed from this picture and he's not removed from yours. So keep this close. The chesed of God is often shown the chesed of those around us. Chesed goes beyond the grave, and it goes beyond the trials of 2021, and it goes beyond the sorrows in your heart. Cherish the places of chesed in your life. Those who demonstrate the character of God himself. God is with you through each other. Indeed, we are made in God's image. So let's be that kind of people for each other. Let's be that kind of people that our covenant towards God is a covenant towards one another and that we would walk into the unknown and the uncertainty with a resurrection hope in our hearts. I hope this has been helpful. I can't wait to unpack it with you guys. Godspeed.